I'm a singer, a songwriter, and a music producer. I travel around the world with my music, but Singapore is where I call home. It's a small place, but there's so much for me to learn about this tiny island and all it has to offer. So far, I've shown you where in the city you can lose yourself in play, find some healing in nature, and even uncover our heritage and history in the wild. Now it's time to see how nature, science, and technology come together. I become a scientist for a day to help protect these majestic birds. Learn how science can help nature bounce back. 38.0, Yasmin. Daniel Sid, very rare species. And see how nature has answers to our problems if only we know where to look. We burn the one of the leaf. The signal can reflect on the screen here. What are some of the hottest trends on your social media feed? Influencers, gadgets, fashion? For many Singaporeans, one thing that gets us really excited are close encounters with our wild side. Like our superstar otters and the owls so many people give a hoot about, there are also the comeback species once thought extinct, like the oriental pied hornbill. Today, I'm a man on a mission. I'm going on a heron watch. Jayasri from NPARC's National Biodiversity Centre explains what it's all about. The aim of this particular program is to bring together the community to collect large-scale data on this particular group of birds called the herons so that uh, the decision makers and the park managers can devise better conservation strategies and measures to protect these species. I'll be collecting data during the Heron Watch, so I will need some training. Turns out, there are at least 19 mind-boggling species of herons, egrets, and bitterns in Singapore. So what bird is this? This is a bittern. I need to click that one. Uh, time, uh, my time was out. Actually, it is a yellow bittern. It's a yellow bittern. I knew it. This is this one. Black crowned night heron. I got it right. There's so many like subtle differences. How are you even going to see that while they're flying? So this is going to be hard. <laughs> Luckily, I'm not going to be thrown into the deep end. Jayasri is leading my first Heron Watch practicum. So these kind of canals usually around the edges, you will also be able to see the herons, yeah? Everyone spotted the bed? So it's along this river to your right on the rocks. Okay, so now you can refer to your ID sheet and let me know what the species is. I see it. I think it's a striated heron. Which one? The bird is still there. And the neck, I can't really see the neck, it's like hidden. I just saw, I saw like a stripe on the head kind of thing. Well, the Citizen Science Program is kind of trying to turn everyday citizens into scientists. But why not just leave it to the scientists? With this kind of community involvement, it is also for us to share the knowledge. What people can get is an intrinsic experience and an appreciation for nature. Tell me what that bird is. What do you think that species is? Purple heron. There's also a whole bunch of sleeping otters. I found a big turtle. Certain species, like the purple heron, are locally endangered. So monitoring their population size will help in conservation efforts. Don't worry, little birdies. You can count on me. Now the training's over, it's time to do some counting for real. The Kurana family, who's done this four times already, will be watching over me. We'll stop at one point, Ru, and then we'll scan. Oh, wow, there, 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 there. There's an egret there, I think. 
Oh, yes. Oh, wow, that's a grey heron in there. Woohoo! So we're in Bishang Amokyo Park, and we just spotted our first heron. I think it was a grey heron, and it was chilling out in the water, and we actually saw it take off. What keeps you coming back to Heron Watch? They're beautiful creatures, very peaceful and elegant. Even after four Heron Watches, we've not been able to see all of them. Wow, wow, two, yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Whoa. Whoa. There's one right above us. So, did you manage to identify this species, Daniel? So, black head, yellow legs, it's the black crown night heron. Wow, we have seen this for the first time. So this pretty. Time. Wow, Anya, we're so lucky today. Nature is everywhere around us, right? So it's just about stepping out and observing. You know, having that childlike curiosity where we go out, observe, learn, see, and take it into us. I feel like we're able to make a difference when you come and do the hair and watches, and it's really great. I think those two are greys, the ones that just flew in. Wow, I, I think I agree with you, right? Because the upper parts were like greyish, right? Mm. Wow, Daniel, you are an expert already. <laughs> I paid attention during my course. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> my favourite part about the heron watch is actually finding where they were nesting. Because we got to see young ones, mature ones, purple herons and grey herons in the trees just side by side. There was just so much going on in such a concentrated area. I think this is the end. Yes, we are at the end. What's our count? And it has in a data sheet. <laughs> Three strided herons. Three strided herons. Like um, ten purple herons. <laughs> wow. And but seven grey herons. Our findings will be consolidated and analyzed by the National Biodiversity Center at a later stage. From scanning the skies to examining what lies in my feet, my journey to understand the link between science and nature continues. Oh, look at that. Perfect. Perfect. When we talk about Singapore's coastline, this is what you expect, right? Beaches, seawalls, ships in the distance. But recently, we've been paying more attention to a different kind of coastal area because of its ability to protect us. I'm talking about mangroves. I'm at Pasteris Park to meet an expert, Prof Dan. He has spent the last 12 years studying mangroves in Singapore. This is a really special mangrove, quite a rare one, because a lot of this area was actually reclaimed, you know, 30 or 40 years ago. A lot of the mangroves that you see here have actually grown back since then, so it was one of our early examples of a mangrove restoration project. So we have a lot of gear here. What are we using it for? So today we're going to do a carbon stock assessment. So the carbon that's contained in mangroves has got a lot of attention recently as a way of uh, potentially mitigating or offsetting uh, climate change. We're going to measure just how much carbon is stored in the plants and soil. We'll collect samples using a process called soil coring. Yasmin, a grad student under Prof Dan, who is studying the flow of nutrients and carbon in coastal habitats, is joining us as well. I've almost lost my shoe. All right, so I think this looks like a good spot. First, you're going to push this down about one meter, so you're going to stop when it gets to about here or so, right? OK. Yep. Is there a reason we need to go that deep? Most of the carbon is in the top one meter. All right. All right, so push it in. Yeah, you might have to just wiggle it around to get through any stones. <laughs> oh, you've hit some sand there. I've hit, I've hit a stone. All right. <laughs> It did not work. <laughs> so mangroves provide us with this whole host of benefits by storing carbon uh, emissions from the atmosphere, uh, sucking them up in their trees, uh, and then putting that carbon into the trees and then into the soil. And so it's one of our key tools to help mitigate climate change. Ooh. There you are, look at that. Ah. 
down. Okay. <laughs> These uh, are the arms of a scientist. <laughs> <exactly>. <laughs> the main objective is that when we pull it out, that nothing falls out of the bottom. All right. So just pull it very slowly and try and lean it uh, towards you a little bit. Okay. Strange noises. <laughs> There you go. Okay. Oh, look at that. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, so with this core, we're basically going back in time. So this is one meter down, and this is all the gray clay material. And then as we get uh, further to the top, this gets the younger soil, and we start to get some of the roots uh, from the mangroves. Once we get the roots, the color changes a little bit, right? It becomes more brown. And this is where most of the carbon is. So I've got some bags here. The carbon is also absorbed into the other parts of the tree, including its leaves, branches, and trunk. By measuring the girth, we can calculate the total amount of carbon stored. So would that formula change for different species? It does. We'll have an individual equation which is matched for that particular species. Is there one for humans? Uh, there isn't, but maybe we could develop one. Cross is zero. So, 13.5. Yasmin, Rhizophora, 13.5. Rhizophora, 13.5. Okay, 7.0, and this is a Brugiera. Brugiera, 7.0. There's another very important thing in the mangrove. You can't spell mangrove without men. <laughs> okay. 38.0, Yasmin. Daniel Sid, very rare species, critically endangered. What is so important about mangroves? A few hundred million people around the tropics rely on these uh, benefits that mangroves provide. So one of them is fisheries. A lot of the commercial fish species that we catch and eat spent at least a bit of their life cycle in the mangrove, often when they were a small juvenile fish. Another benefit they provide is coastal protection. So all of the kind of crazy above ground roots that we find in a mangrove, that's a great sponge to waves generated by storms. How do you enjoy your first day in mangrove boot camp? It was fun, not too muddy. I feel it was pretty kind to us today. That's it. <laughs> all those soil samples we took, we're gonna take them back to the lab and see how much carbon is inside. All right. Okay, so we've got all of our samples from the mangrove. Once we've dried it um, and ground it up, we're going to just take a really small, less than a gram sample from this, and then we're going to weigh it and put it into the total organic carbon analyzer, which basically vaporizes the whole thing and um, tells us how much carbon is inside. Half a small spoon, not very efficient for soup. All right, so the sample's finished running. And here it tells us that out of that tiny spoonful of soil that we put in, about 7.722% of it is carbon. So how would this compare to another forested area, like a rainforest? Globally, on average, mangroves store about three to five times as much carbon per hectare as other types of forests. So certainly for climate change mitigation, you get more bang for your buck. We need to be able to provide managers and decision makers with the knowledge of how much carbon is here, what is their coastal protection value. Once we have that information, managers can make the best decision that incorporates mangroves into the rest of our urban landscape. It's wonderful to see the symbiotic relationship between us and the mangroves, where we protect the mangroves and the mangrove protects us. That's the way to go. Coming up next, I see how nature is not only a mother to us, but also a teacher. The mantis shrimp, see it? Ooh, Very ooh. aggressive. This is inspired after a feature plant.
While exploring the ways that science and nature come together, I came across a term I've never heard before, biomimicry. It comes from the Greek word bios, which means life, and mimesis, which means to imitate. But what does it mean to imitate life? In science, that means looking to nature to find answers to the problems that we humans are currently facing. Materials scientist Prof Ali often looks for solutions in the most unexpected places. This is our tank room where we maintain all of our sea creatures that we're studying in the lab. So let me show you a few here. This one is actually a sea cucumber. Right, so, whoops, ooh, ooh, ooh. that's it. Ooh, it's spraying. He's unhappy, it's spraying Eam. water. <laughs> this is a very interesting system because the sea cucumber is a very soft body, but when you get threatened, it will stiffen the entire body. This actually could inspire a new kind of exoskeleton. Depending on when you need it, you can actually make the prosthetic hard and stiff, or you can make it very soft. This is our good friend, the mantis shrimp. This animal has a very, very fast punch. We've been studying for many years. See, ooh, very ooh. aggressive. You just make some holes here in the it's muscle. the shell. But with, well, a, you know, with a punch? Yep. So my name is Ali, so this is the Mohammed Ali of the sea. <laughs> this is called a club. Basically a hammer. We've been trying to understand what is the chemistry, what is the structure of this material. So make new kind of, uh, for instance, uh, artificial teeth or other kind of, again, bulletproof vessels that are very strong and resistant. This is a small one, a small baby one. Try to poke it. Nature is a much better chemist than me, and sometimes I run out of ideas, so you just step outside and look at different systems, and you can learn so many things. I always think about the underlying reason that nature has done it in a specific way. Prof Ali also shared that biomimicry is applied in other fields, like architecture, transport systems, and even medicine. You know the mRNA vaccine so many of us have taken? Our body doesn't reject it because the doses are packaged inside a membrane that mimics the structure of our cells. Inspired by the wisdom of nature, Prof Ali has led his team to breakthroughs in some mind-blowing innovations, such as this collaboration with Harvard University. Even when I shake it, it doesn't move, even if I'm like tilting it. Yeah, this is basically that mimics the mucus of the pitcher plant. The secret sauce. We give the glass a special coating. Is that enough? Yeah, 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 we'll be fine. Get a little shaky, shaky. Is it okay if it touches my finger? Yeah, yeah it's okay. It's totally inoffensive. Not gonna poison me? No, no, no. Nothing will poison <laughs> you. So now you can repeat it. All right. The same thing as before. Remember how it was sticky before? You can probably really feel, right? Yeah, uh, it's, it's it already in. kind of moving around. Look at that, like a oh, nice. Yep. <laughs> you see here now? That is dancing, a, right? This is a, a lot of difference. Yeah. Now it slides so it doesn't everywhere. stick. And so this is inspired after the pitcher plant. So in a pitcher plant, there's a mucus and the ants that go through to, to get trapped. They get go, they slide down, and they get eaten by the liquid inside the plant. We can make some coating that we would put on a boat, and it would prevent the animals, such as the muscle, to stick onto it. Clusters of mussels can reduce a vessel's speed and efficiency at sea when they build up on its hull and rudders. So, a non-stick coating like this might just make a very big difference in the shipping industry. Looks like the possibilities are endless for the curious. Even the teeth found in the tentacles of jumbo squids have inspired the creation of a sustainable material. In this packaging, once it's over, you could eat it or you could dump it in the ocean or landfill it would be completely metabolized and recycled. It's completely mimicked because the chemistry is identical. Prof Ali isn't the only one passionate about biomimicry in science. His colleague, Prof Chen, is also working on something cool. Let me show you this plant. It's a very nice fry trap. It's a plant to catch an insect. I poke it. Yeah, you can try. Ah! Now, in fact, we figure out a way 
to close the fry trap without touch. It took us a few years to talk to the plants, make it close. This is an electronic skin created by Prof Chen and his team. When attached to electrodes, messages and instructions can be sent to the plant, like how receptors in our human skin send signals through our nerves to our brain when we touch something. With a mobile phone app, we can command the Venus flytrap to close. Now I show you another experiment. Plants can talk to us. We just put our e singing electrodes on top of our skin surface. And then we burn the one of the leaf. The signal can reflect on the screen here. So this dip doesn't mean the plants are in pain. Absolutely. Same as a human, when we get cut it, we feel pain, the signal will transport to our brain. To actually be able to quantify it and see it like this is really amazing. In the future, farmers may be able to tell if their crops are in good shape way before the physical ailments manifest. And when applied to humans, doctors might be able to receive signals from our bodies to diagnose our medical condition without even the need for physical contact. Endless possibilities, I tell you. Biomimicry is more a process to learn from nature, to create something like e skin. But today we talk a lot about bio inspiration. It's go beyond the nature capability. We are not only working on mimic the process, we want to create something beyond nature in a way that can make our device work much better, much precise, much efficient. I've had my mind blown at the ways nature can thrive with science and how human technology continues to push new boundaries with what we learned from nature. What lies ahead? I'll endeavor to find out more. <laughs>